thank you very much. And what I'm going to try and do this evening is uh, it's not going to be a talk for people who know a lot about astronomy. This is a talk for people who wonder why on earth it is that you spend several hundred million euros to build a satellite to measure the positions of the stars. It does sound rather uh, like a waste of money. Don't we know where the stars are? Um, and what are we going to get by measuring them more accurately? Well, I'm going to start off, this is a, a photograph that uh, I took at the launch of Gaia, this latest in the um, journey, this, this long historical journey of measuring the distances and the uh, positions of the stars. And that's a little bit of the, the first part of my theme that I'm going to focus quite a bit on. Um, going back to the really the dawn of our appearance on Earth, um, a scientific journey that's actually lasted several millennia. And you can do no better than to look up the road and uh, look at the thick new range um, and observe it, or, a, a structure, a man-made structure, uh, dating from 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, uh, enormous complexity to build this and something which is uh, aligned with the positions of the sun on a particular day of the year. Um, the reason for that I'm not going to go into, I'm not really qualified to speak about that, but we have these observatory or these, these facilities, some people think of them as observatories, they're probably burial sites or worship sites or whatever, but the very existence of these demonstrates that even 5,000 years ago, uh, humanity, humans had some idea of the regular motions of the earth, the stars, and so on. And um, I think, you know, I think it's worth stopping from time to time and wondering if you yourself were put out in a field and tried to figure out when the seasons actually recur and the phases of the moon and the motions of Mercury. Um, these are things that we can understand relatively easily from the textbooks, but if we were sat down trying to figure them out for ourselves, I think we would struggle quite a lot. And, uh, for example, um, this, this whole process then of, of looking at the stars and trying to understand the stars and uh, trying to figure out what the stars actually tell us about the universe is a journey that's taken us from these early uh, prehistoric sites through to uh, something like the most advanced uh, technological satellite uh, that we've seen. This, this is Gaia. It's a massive uh, 10 meter uh, diameter uh, sun shield and solar array. And this is the heart of the satellite. And I will tell you a little bit more as the talk goes on what this is for and why it was built. But I'm going to go back not to as far ago as Newgrange and Stonehenge because there is no real recorded information. We don't know what people were thinking and why they built these structures. But the first recorded signs of civilization we have is around 2,000 years ago, around the time, a little bit more than 2,000 years ago, the time of the ancient Greeks who tried to put order into the knowledge of the natural world. And one of the things they asked was, well, w w what are the stars? Um, and at the time, of course, uh, people didn't know what they were. There were different hypotheses at the time. Some people thought that they were... Um, uh, a common idea at the time was that these were holes in a celestial vault. You had a big kind of ceiling, and there were holes in this ceiling and there was intense sources of brightness beyond, and where the light shone through these holes in the celestial vault, this is what we, we, we saw as the stars. Um, now, that may seem rather um, prehistoric in thinking, or very primitive in our thinking, but it's interesting to bring that up almost to the present date and point out that it was only in 1927 that the energy source of the stars, the energy source of the sun, was actually understood for the first time. So uh, I'll come on to that in just a moment, but the 
Great planet, a great problem for the Greeks who were trying to understand and, and put order into the natural world and, uh, and try and understand. Uh, this was at the time, pre-Socratic time, people thought that the Earth was flat uh, and it was around the time of the Greeks the, uh, that they realised that the Earth was round um, I'm cutting through an enormous amount of, uh, of history here, but the, the next great mystery was, was the stars. They were moving uh, in um, a regular motion. The, the stars appear to us to move across the celestial sphere as, as the night goes on. They retain their fixed positions, one with respect to each other, but um, the there was no understanding at this stage why this should be so. Why was this motion taking place? And particularly baffling was the motion of the sun, the moon, and the five planets that were known at the time. These were moving across the sky far more rapidly than the stars. Uh, they were called planets. Planet, apparently in Greek, means wanderer. And they were called the wanderers. Um, and what they were or why they moved or why they moved in this mysterious way was unknown. And an awful lot of thought and study was put into trying to comprehend the motions of these planets. Why did the sun move across the sky the way it did? Why did the moon? Um, and essentially, this was a mystery. There were one or two people who put up more or less the right idea, but they were not, that wasn't the uh, uh, common thinking of the time. And people constructed ever more elaborate hypotheses of the planets, uh, uh, the stars, uh, uh, sorry, the planets moving in what were called epicycles, and they had to move in these complex motions because we now know that as the planets go around the sun and they move in elliptical orbits around the sun, so where we sit on the Earth and we look at the planets moving, they appear from the Earth to move in very complex orbits. And it wasn't until the time of... Uh, uh, Copernicus, who put forward the idea that the, the sun was at the centre of the solar system and not the earth, that suddenly the, sense, the, the motion of the planets made sense. Um, the other real complication, the big barrier to understanding this, is that the planets don't move in circular orbits, the planets move in elliptical orbits. And we understand that very well today because of our understanding of Newtonian dynamics. But at the time, this was not known, it was not understood, and it remained not understood for the subsequent 1,500 years. So we now know uh, much more about the stars, and, and our own sun is a star. Uh, our own sun is our nearest star, and it looks big and it looks bright because it's so close, but all the other stars are to some extent similar to our own sun, and the reason the stars seem so faint is that they're at such an enormous distance. And we know that now. But our own sun is the nearest example of a star. It's a big ball of gas. Um, and we're getting better and better views of the sun as time goes on. This is an observation made from uh, the satellite High Node. Uh, and in monitoring the sun, you see these uh, very active centers on the sun's surface. These are coronal mass ejections, um, and we now know that the sun and all the other stars is basically a big ball of hydrogen, and this hydrogen is being burned in nuclear reactions to form helium and the higher elements. So this is an example of a, of a nuclear uh, explosion on the right there. Um, one gram of hydrogen converted into helium through the process of nuclear fusion gives about as much energy as uh, uh, the biggest power stations on Earth at the moment in one day. Um, and the sun is then burning its hydrogen at about five million tons per second. So one gram of fusion power is, is uh, equivalent to the biggest power station and the sun is losing mass by this process at about five million tons per second. Now, I remember when I was quite young, I wasn't particularly interested in the, sky, in the stars uh, as, a, as an observer, but I was interested in numbers like this, and it made me very, very worried. Uh, losing five million tons of a second, you know, how long is the sun going to last? Now, in fact, as we know now, you don't have to worry 
because the sun weighs more than a thousand million, 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 million tons. And that means that it can afford to, to burn its fuel at five million tons a second for the next five billion years. So, we've got a long way to go before the sun runs out. And if I now just, I just go back and I put this in a history of the understanding of the stars over the first 2,000 years, um, starting from the time of the ancient Greeks. They were preoccupied with issues like the size and the distance of the sun and the moon and the motion of the planets. They put a lot of effort into that, but failed to come up with the correct explanation because they thought the Earth was at the center of the solar system and everything moved around the Earth. Um, things were going on in the developing Islamic cultures outside of Europe, but on the European scene, you have to move uh, right up uh, 1,500 years after the Greeks to the resurgence of scientific inquiry, the time of Copernicus, who first postulated that the Earth and the planets were moving around the sun. Um, better observations by Tycho Brahe at the end of the 1500s. Uh, laws of gravity and motion were formulated by Kepler and Newton. And uh, this enabled, for the first time, um, scientists to have an understanding of the motions of the bodies that we see around us. Um, charting star positions had not only a kind of an abstract idea, uh, ideal, uh, going back to Mesopotamian times, the studying of the seasons was important for growing crops and things like that, but around 1500, 1600, it became more pressing for the point of view of navigation. Enormous uh, numbers of ships and vast economic sums were lost because ships were sinking because navigation uh, was poorly, uh, was, the, being able to navigate at sea was, was not possible because one had no mechanism for doing so. And understanding the Earth's motion through space, understanding uh, maps of the stars, and the development of accurate time positional keepers together allowed uh, navigation um, at sea to become reliable. Now, uh, around 17, in the early 1700s, Halley, who is important for a number of things, Halley's Comet, for example, he was the first to measure the movement of stars through space. Now, you go out at different times of the nights and you see the stars in different positions, but remember, the relative positions of the stars appears unchanged. If you look at the Great Bear, the Plough, you see it on one night, you see it at another season. It may be in a different part of the sky, but the configuration of the stars is exactly the same. So you may be left with the feeling that the stars are actually fixed somehow in space with the Earth rotating. Um, this is not in fact true. The stars are all moving through space, uh, very often at very high velocity. So typically uh, a star is moving through space at something like 30, 50 kilometers per second. Every second the star is moving 50 kilometers. But because they're such enormous distances away, we have no perception of that motion. And it wasn't until 1718 that Halley, who had been measuring, comparing star charts that he was manufacturing in the early 1700s, and he was comparing them with the charts that the ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchos had made 2,000 years ago, and he saw that three stars were significantly displaced from the positions that uh, Hipparchos had charted. And this was the first time, just uh, 300 years ago, uh, the realization that the stars were actually moving through space. Um, a very important discovery, not so well known outside of the field of, of pure astronomy or pure science, was James Bradley. Um, Bradley was trying to measure uh, the distances to the stars through a process that I'll talk about later, but he, he measured instead something called stellar aberration. Um, it demonstrated that the Earth was moving through space. It actually allowed scientists to have the first real understanding of the, of the finite speed of light, and it led to the understanding of the immensities of stellar distances. And a little bit later, in the 1700s, Herschel was able to infer that the Sun itself was, like the rest of the stars, moving through space. Um, this is a picture of an area of the sky called the Hyades. This is a bright star called Aldebaran, and if you look closely at Aldebaran, this is what Halley noticed, that it had moved from the location that Hipparchos had charted it 
uh, to a different location in the sky, and he saw this for a number of different stars, um, and he was able to infer uh, 2,000 years apart some of these stars are moving through space. Motion <coughs> motions are typically very, very small, so um, it's very difficult to discern this, but the other important, very, very important reason why we're trying to measure these stellar positions very accurately is the effect of parallax. And I want to explain that uh, a little bit carefully. You know if you are um, standing somewhere, you close one eye, close the other eye, alternate left and right eyes, then something in the foreground seems to move with respect to things in the background. Uh, you can try that experiment yourself. It's like moving along in a car and seeing a telegraph pole moving with respect to a distant village, church spire in the distance. The relative distances of these two means that the viewing direction changes and one object appears to move with respect to another. Now, the same is true uh, with the Earth going around the Sun. The Earth goes around the Sun in its annual orbit once a year. And... People around the time of Copernicus, as soon as this theory was postulated that the Earth was moving around the Sun, the consequence of that should be that if some stars are nearer than other stars, then if we look at this star at one time of the year, we'll see it projected against these stars. And if we look at it at a different time of the year, we'll see it slightly different projected against the more distant stars. So scientists realized this in about 1600, and there began the race to measure the first trigonometric parallax. So the idea is that you measure the star positions very carefully, you measure them one star with respect to other stars, and you try and see whether during the course in the, of the year the star positions are varying. Now this was important because uh, of two things. I suppose on the one hand, um, this effect would demonstrate convincingly that Copernicus was right, the Earth was moving around the Sun. But at the same time, and more importantly for scientific uh, reasons, it would tell you the distances to the stars. Now, there is no other way of determining stellar distances. Stars are very different in their characteristics. They're different brightnesses, different sizes, different masses, different radii, different ages. And there's no sort of standard that you can impose that allows you to see whether a star is at a certain distance or not. A star with a certain brightness seen by the human eye could either be um, a very bright star, a very luminous star at a very large distance, or it could be a very uh, subluminous star, a very, very uh, faint star very close to us, and it would have the same visual appearance. Um, and this method of trigonometric parallax is the only way of measuring stellar distances. So um, people started in around 1600, and they started improving their measurement techniques. And a lot of these methods of uh, constructing these instruments uh, called uh, um, quadrants and uh, sextants and uh, various other elaborate instruments, um, these were developed in secrecy because one scientist was competing against another. And around this time, 1650s, 1700s, those scientists who were able to um, divide the circle, uh, measure angles uh, better than anyone else, um, were elevated to lofty positions in academic societies, FRSs and, and so on. Uh, but it actually took 250 years between the first attempts to measure stellar distances and the first successful attempts. And I do wonder today if you submitted a grant application and uh, said that, well, you're embarking on a journey, it's going to be a very, very long journey, and it might take 250 years. I don't know anything about the funding mechanism in Ireland, but I can tell you in the UK, in England, you would be absolutely onto a loser. I think they require results within the year at the latest. The problem was, of course, that the size of space and the difficulty of the task are enormous. Um, we imagine the sun shrunk to the size of a marble, this huge, impossibly large ball of uh, hydrogen gas shrunk to the size of a marble, around one centimetre. Then on this scale, the Earth would be a grain of salt about a metre uh, distance. Pluto would lie out at about 40 metres. And the nearest star would be out at 200 kilometres. So 
space is extremely empty. Uh, space is very, very large. And where I live, just outside of Bristol, and where we are now uh, in Dublin, um, if we could measure this angle, I stand here with my arms apart, uh, the angle viewed from Bristol to Dublin, or vice versa, that's an angle, and that angle is about one, one second of arc. So divide 360 degrees of a circle into 360 degrees, one degree is 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds, and that's where we are with this one second of angle. And the first satellite that I'm going to come on to talk about, Hipparchos, measured about a thousandth of that angle. And the second satellite that I will talk about, Gaia, measures down to about one millionth of that angle. So extremely tiny angles, extremely difficult, and these are the kind of precisions that are necessary to measure distances and motions of the stars. So distances are seriously big. We can show it on that kind of shrunken model of the solar system or light. But if we look at the speed of light, it, it, light travels at 186,000 miles a second. Uh, we're in Ireland, so I think you think in kilometers here, I think, 300,000 300, kilometers. Um, and at that speed, 300,000 kilometers per second, it takes 0.1 of a second to go right the way around the Earth. It takes three seconds to go to the moon and back. It takes eight minutes to go from the sun to the Earth. It takes 40 minutes to go from Jupiter to the Earth. And it takes four years, traveling at the speed of light, to go from the nearest star to the Earth. It takes 30,000 years from the center of our galaxy to get to the Earth. And it takes 150,000 years from the next nearest galaxy and if you're a cosmologist, we go on further and further out, and it takes many millions or billions of years to go out to the furthest expanses of our universe. So first star distances um, were only measured, the first success was uh, after 250 years marathon journey of measurements, and three scientists, Bessel, Henderson, and Struve, um, came up with their measurements roughly at the same time, in around 1838, 1839, and Bessel, who was the first to announce his discovery, was awarded the Royal Astronomy Society's gold medal. And this was as charted by um, um, uh, John Herschel, who was president at the time. He described this as the greatest and most glorious triumph which practical astronomy has ever witnessed. So what's happened since, 18, uh, say, the mid-1800s and, uh, and about uh, the late two uh, around uh, 2000, in the intervening 150 years, astronomers have built countless bigger and bigger telescopes to measure fainter stars, more star motions, more star distances. We've got a few thousand of these. Um, we can go back and look at some of these historical monuments, these masterpieces, these things that were the cutting edge of science a hundred years ago, we have the astrographic catalogue. Um, uh, it ran, this is a massive program that ran for about 40 years. Um, measuring techniques were very, very simple. Uh, we think of them now as very, very primitive. Um, this is the Vatican zone of the astrographic catalogue. It was actually measured by nuns who were uh, given these tasks of measuring the photographic plates by eye recording the numbers by hands. Uh, it's said that in the Netherlands they gave this task to prisoners. Uh, um, now you may wonder what incentive the prisoners had to give accurate measurements. Well, you give measurements to two sets of prisoners and uh, they better agree, otherwise they, they get into even more trouble. Uh, of course, we don't give this kind of problem to prisoners anymore. You give it to PhD students. Um, Schmidt telescopes, which were very big in the uh, second half of the 19, uh, 20th century, uh, moving on to the giants of today, the European Southern Observatory's VLT. And uh, this is the, an artist's conception. Here is a car down here. This is the artist's conception of the ELT, Europe's extremely large telescope. Um, 
I wrote 2016. I don't know when I first made this slide. It was about 10 years ago, but it's, it's, it's 10 years. I, I, I must change that. But the point is, with even with all of these telescopes, even with these biggest telescopes that we're constructing, it is all but impossible to measure these stellar distances, to measure these tiny angles, because the angles are so small and on the Earth's surface, we're sitting underneath an atmosphere which is twinkling and uh, continuously in motion. And that prevents us from measuring the kind of accuracies that are needed to measure the distances to the star through this effect of parallactic motion as the Earth goes around the Sun. So, um, I'm just going to pause there and just recap the main point uh, uh, that I've got to at this part of the talk. It is to say that Estimating the distances to the stars is very diff difficult. Measuring them, we can't go there. We can't bounce radar off them. There's no way of determining those distances directly. But it turns out that the fact that the Earth is going around the Sun provides this mechanism of having different viewing directions of the stars and therefore allows us, by somewhat complicated processes, which I'm not going to go into, allows you to measure these distances. Um, but to get out to reasonable distances that are of interest to science, we need to measure very, very, very tiny angles, and they become very, very difficult. You can't do it underneath the Earth's atmosphere, but it was realised in about the 1960s that you could do this by putting a satellite above the Earth's atmosphere. So, here is the problem. Um, put a telescope on the ground, you've got starlight coming, uh, propagating out, and hits the Earth's atmosphere, which is this kind of turbulent mass. You know, if you look a, at a at a petrol station, at the fumes rising up from uh, a car being filled with petrol or a hot, a hot day on a road, and you see the shimmering. Uh, what you're seeing there is the atmospheric turbulence, uh, greatly magnified, and it's this effect that's stopping us from measuring these positions very accurately. Um, the angles that we're trying to measure, uh, if you put a golf ball, if we were here in Ireland looking at the US, looking at the... Uh, Empire State Building, um, uh, is that the Chrysler Building? Empire State Building and the Chry Empire State Building and the Chrysler. It doesn't matter at this level. It doesn't matter. Put a golf ball on the top, and that's about one second of arc. And if you could imagine Neil standing on the surface of the Moon, he would also be subtending an angle of about one second of arc as seen from from the Earth. So that's the angles, and eventually a satellite, was, uh, satellite concept was put together, and this is it. This is uh, Hipparchos, and it was developed through the years 1981 to 1989. It was tested on the ground. It was a, uh, a big technological challenge. It was launched in 1989, 25 years ago, and just for fun, I'm going to allow you to witness a launch. So at the top of this rocket in uh, 1989 was one of the most delicate instruments uh, conceived and built, uh, put on the top of this rocket that is shaking uh, uh, and, and propelled into orbit. And I'm not going to take you through the details. Um, that doesn't need to interest us now, but the Hipparchos satellite was launched, it operated, it viewed the sky, it spanned, uh, it operated for four years and it produced the, um, not only a, uh, accurate catalogues, you open it and it looks like a telephone directory. Um, I guess that shows my age because probably most young people here don't know what telephone directories are. You just have the web, but in the olden days you had telephone directories. And if you open the star catalogue, it looks a little bit like a telephone directory. It's pages and pages of numbers. Um, you can replicate that as charts and it looks like this, you know, star charts. But the essential importance of this is that for each of the stars we measured there, you have an estimate not only of where it is, the position of the star, but how it's moving through space and how far it is away. And those properties of the star, the star's motion through space and the distance of the star, turn out to be of very, very great importance to astronomers and scientists. Um, 
for the reasons, I, and I will say a little bit more now uh, uh, about that, um, we can't see our own galaxy. Uh, we don't exactly know what our own galaxy would look like, but we can see um, other galaxies with big telescopes, and, and this is Andromeda. Our galaxy probably wouldn't look very much different to that, and we would be out here somewhere close to one of the spiral arms uh, about... 30,000 light years from the center, and the stars you see in the night sky are the stars, our neighbors. Um, so you are here. And the galaxy we now know rotates. If, if we go back to this picture, this is not a static structure. Um, a galaxy can't sit like this and last indefinitely in a stationary state. This galaxy is actually rotating. Our galaxy is rotating. And we know from measuring these star motions, the velocities through space, that our galaxy takes something like 250 million years to make a complete rotation. And we can put together a model. This is a little bit based on some of the results from Hipparchos. But we can animate this model. If we were looking from the top, it looks like a fairly flattened structure. And as I sort of pan round and look at the galaxy from the edge, you can see the whole thing is rotating very slowly, but the stars are going up and down as well, attracted by the gravitational forces in the galaxy. And in, red and blue, um, in white and red are two different types of stars that are of interest to, to astronomers. The white are the, called the thin, thin disk stars, and the red stars are thick disk stars, probably a remnant of a, another galaxy which was captured, cannibalized by our own galaxy uh, many uh, billions of years ago. So, again, a, a photograph of the Milky Way, of the stars seen from the Earth, captures an essentially static picture of the universe. Uh, nothing can really be further than the truth. All these stars are in motion, but... The reason we, we don't see, we're not sensitive to this motion, is that the stars are so very, very far away. Um, let's give one example. Ursa Major, the Great Bear, the Plough, uh, an asterism. These are not physically re related stars. These are just bright stars that happen to look in a particularly attractive constellation that's easy to recognize. Um, all of these stars are moving, and it turns out they're moving in different directions. Uh, we use these two stars, these are the pointers, they take us to the pole star, the point about which the celestial sphere appears to rotate. Um, and uh, this star is actually a double and used by people as a test of their visual acuity. If you have very good eyesight, you may be able to recognize that that's a double. But what would happen if we looked at Ursa Major this is Ursa Major today, and you can see these are the four star these are the seven stars that make up the configuration of the plough. And I've put on there arrows which indicate the direction that each of these stars are moving in. And these measurements have come from Hipparchos. Um, they're all moving in slightly different directions at different velocities. So if we were to run our movie or come back to Earth in 100,000 years from now, the plough wouldn't look like this anymore, it would look like this. So all the stars are moving uh, and space will look very different um, in, in some years from now. So um, just recapturing then some of the key points of Hipparchos, it was first conceived by a scientist, Pierre Lacroute, French scientist in 1968. It took 12 years of lobbying and developments and persuasion and studies and fundraising and so on and it was finally accepted by ESA in 1980. Um, I joined ESA in 1980 and became the project scientist in 1981, and the satellite was eventually launched in 89, operated until 1993, and the final results were published in 1997. So this is already a time span of about 30 years from conception to end, uh, of which I was involved for 17. Now, I'm not going to go through um, details of what this tells us about the, um, the, the properties of the stars. I mean, why is it that astronomers are so interested in these? That's the subject, perhaps, of another lecture. 
But what I can show you is some kind of visual um, uh, cues to show you what it is that we have, uh, uh, have been able to piece together. Now, if you look up, take a dark location, look up into the night sky, you can see this region of the, of the Hyades. The Hyades cluster is a, a sort of loose but quite prominent association of bright stars. Um, most amateur astronomers will be able to recognize that visually. The Pleiades is up here somewhere. And this is the star Aldebaran that I showed you earlier on is moving very significantly. And what Hipparchos has, has been able to do is to piece together not only the motions of these brightest stars, but all of the stars. And I'm going to now run a movie which we can reconstruct uh, a simulation over the next 60,000 years. And it shows you how the stars are moving uh, over this period of 60,000 years. You can see Aldebaran is moving in one direction. The Hyades cluster of stars are moving in another direction. You've got some stars which are zipping through at relatively high speeds. These are visitors from much more distant regions of the galaxy uh, called our galaxy halo. So that was a movie which is reconstructed. Uh, maybe just run that through again. Uh, you can see a, a fast mover up there in that corner. And this is just a visualization then of the velocities, the motions of stars through space. And it's the collective motions of, of this 100,000 stars that has given us so much information about the structure of, of our own galaxy. Now, I'm going to try and convince you that we could also measure distances. And the way um, uh, five years ago I, I gave a stereoscopic projection of some of these, I'm not going to do that. That's a very elaborate process, setting up a stereoscopic display. But what I can show you is a kind of simulation of the stereoscopic by, by changing the viewing direction, um, going from side to side, and seeing how the stars would move, uh, how the nearby stars would move with respect to the background stars, as we've measured them with the Hipparchos satellite. Alternatively, if you can try and think of yourself as an interstellar space traveler, if you could travel out a very large distance, many light years, uh, the stars would appear to, the nearby stars would move with respect to the background stars in exactly this way. But very accurate measurements made with Hipparchos allow us to reconstruct that and to give a positional estimate of each of these. And you can see the background stars appear to be stationary or the fainter stars generally appear to be stationary. That's because they're a long way away. Um, and the more nearby stars are moving with a, a greater uh, degree. Now I can add those two together, the lateral motion due to the parallax and the linear motion to the star's velocity through, through space, and what you see then is a much more complex pattern of motions of the stars, and this is exactly the way the stars would really appear to be if you could look at them carefully with a, a strong magnifying glass. Um, this lateral oscillatory motion is occurring on the time scale of a year as the Earth is going around the Sun, and these linear motions superimposed on that is the effect of the stars themselves moving through space. And the Hipparchos satellite was designed to measure these separations repeatedly, many, many times over several years, and throw back a set of data to the ground that could be reconstructed and from which you could get these uh, positions and distances. Now, if you sit there thinking, well, I don't really understand how that was done, then just bear in mind it took an army of about 2,000 people, 300 scientists, 2,000 industrial engineers, uh, many years to actually put all this together and make it work. So don't feel too embarrassed or too slow if you don't grab everything there. But I hope you've got the general principles of that. Um, the Pleiades star clusters, I'll show you the same simulation for the Pleiades. The Pleiades is a much more concentrated set of stars that you can again see with the naked eye from dark locations, the Seven Sisters. Um, through a small telescope, it's a, it's a beautiful sight. These are, st these are young stars, so they're very bright, they're very white, they're very luminous, and they move in, a, in a, uh, a manner which is distinct from the Hyades, but you can still see this is a cluster. These stars were born together at the same time. They're moving together through our galaxy at the same time and superimposed on that are many other stars which are moving more randomly, more chaotically. But the goal in astronomy is to try and understand all these motions, to try and understand um, uh, 
what it tells us about the structure of our galaxy. And remember that this little mo uh, uh, simulation is the uh, position that these stars would, would go through over a period of about 150,000 years. So that's the motions of the Pleiades stars through space. We can look again at this oscillatory motion due to the Earth's motion around the Sun. As the Earth goes around the Sun, the viewing direction changes, and this is what you would see um, if you could measure these. Again, it's uh, exaggerated, but that's the effect. And we can add those two together to see as the stars move through space and as the Earth goes around the Sun, you end up with this very complex, very, very beautiful pattern of, of, of stellar motions. So going back to the title of the talk, you know, when I talked about measuring star positions, the point is we're not so interested in the positions. What we're interested in is how the positions change. And if we can measure very accurately how the positions change, we get measurements of the stellar distances and the stellar motions. Now, I'm quickly going to go on in my final 10 minutes to talk about Gaia. That's the satellite which has just been launched. Um, the Hipparchos results, uh, this is the site I showed already. Um, Hipparchos was conceived in, in 68, very early on in the, uh, in the era of the space age. Um, quite remarkable in the sense that something so abstract, so arcane as measuring star positions was at the forefront of many people's minds even uh, back in the 60s. Um, so the Hipparchos results were published in 1997. And already people were thinking about how you could do better. It was very quickly evident that you can't make these kind of measurements from the ground. You could never hope to compete with what Hipparchos was doing uh, other than by putting another satellite into space. Um, so uh, my colleague, Lennart Lindegren, he's uh, uh, an exceptional Swedish scientist, uh, and myself, um, sat together and came up with various ideas. We conceived of this project back in 1993. Um, many people got, uh, got involved in this, many, many talented instrument designers, uh, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, and so on. It was accepted by ESA in 2000 and built and eventually launched in December of last year, so just three months ago. Um, Gaia will operate from its orbit for about five years. Um, the final results are not expected until about 2021, so it seems a long time uh, to wait. But um, if we go back and think about the historical context of measuring star positions, we'll see it's, it's really uh, what is 10 years in the evolution of science over many, um, many millennia. I think one other interesting point to stress here before I move on is our perception of science. Um, I worked on the Hipparchos project in, uh, starting in 1980. We launched in 1989. And we really felt we were really at the cutting edge of, of science. This was really, you know, I was very grateful in a way that I'd been born at this time uh, um, when these advances were possible. We lived at a very exceptional time where we were to make these, able to make these spectacular advances. Now, of course, all of this was an illusion because uh, 25 years ago, we were working at the cutting edge of science. But if you tell people today that the Hipparchos satellite sent back 24 kilobits of data per second, uh, measured 100,000 stars, was 30 centimeters in diameter, uh, people would smile a little bit and, and wonder whether you weren't perhaps a little bit strange to think that this was a remarkable achievement. But here we are again at the cutting edge of science, 2013, 2014, and we're all sitting in the room. There's a number of scientists here, and we have this great feeling that we're right at the cutting edge. But I think it's important to stand back and occasionally and just realize that we're only there temporarily and look back in, in wonder at the advances that have been made necessary to get us here. So I showed you the launch of Hipparchos, and I'll show you the launch of Gaia. So this was December 2013, three months ago. We're in the final moments of final countdown for the sixth Soyuz to fly from French Guiana. The exciting has been high all week, as you can expect. Another of those moments now as we approach The ignition sequence, 20 engines are the ones. The emission sequence is in three stages. Part of it 
is a sequence from minus 17 seconds down to minus Gaia is right up here minus. in the nose cone. The engines are tested. They're the arms rolling away. That's one of the final moments. At minus 15 seconds is the first control of the ignition. At minus 7 seconds is another one at about half pressure. And then at minus 3 seconds, the order is given for the third. final phase. There's the entry. Arms going. So it takes me back to the first slide, second slide. This is what was launched. This is Gaia. It uh, is uh, state-of-the-art in every respect. It's got this massive 10-meter diameter sun shield uh, and solar array. This is to protect, uh, first of all, to give the satellite power, but also to protect this very delicate payload from the thermal loading from the sun. The temperature of the, of the experiment on Gaia is maintained to something like 50 micro kelvins across this quite big payload diameter. Uh, right in the center of it, oh, right, some facts about launched on uh, December 2013. It's going out to the Lagrange point. This is a very a particular orbital location. Um, the satellite is being verified and tested now. It will be operated from 2014 until 2019. Um, the satellite spins slowly observes the whole sky and discerns these different little motions of the stars that I've shown you in the preceding simulations. But now instead of 100,000 stars, we're measuring the motions and distances of about 1 billion, 1,000 million stars. Um, and the uh, objective to understand uh, our, uh, our comprehension of our galaxy and the universe. The way it works is... Uh, is, is the, the details are, are, are subtle, but there are two quite big mirrors, one, two. Um, there's a focal plane here, which is a, a, a big panel of CCD detectors, like your own digital cameras, uh, but a, a much bigger focal plane. And the satellite spins about an axis in this direction. And what happens is that the star images bounce off these primary mirrors and fall onto this detector. The detector is this massive uh, focal plane. Each of these CCD detectors is much bigger than the detectors on, an on a domestic uh, digital camera. This is about one meter in size. So you've got a one me meter by one meter silicon carpet. Uh, this thing is rotating as the satellite rotates and the star images are moving across that and we're measuring the positions extremely accurately. So it's sitting out in an orbit called the L2 orbit. If you go from the sun to the earth and then continue on out one and a half million kilometers, uh, you get to this L2 orbit, and it's a very stable configuration where the gravitational forces of the solar system bodies is quite neutral. Uh, it means you've got an uninterrupted view of space from here you can look outwards in this direction. As the Earth goes around the sun, you're always looking roughly outwards, so you have an uninterrupted view of the whole sky and outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, everything about Gaia is big. This is one of the main computers that's being used, uh, and this is in a deconsecrated church in Barcelona, which has now been taken over by Spain's third biggest computer, which is being dedicated to the data analysis of Gaia. But many other computers are being used simultaneously. This is not the only one. Data is coming down at something like uh, 10 megabits per second uh, continuously for the lifetime of the project. And this all goes into some huge number crunching operation from which the star positions will drop out. So I showed you early on this picture of Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. I pointed out that we're here. Now, on this scale, the volume out to which we were able to measure distances and motions of the stars with Hipparchos 
magnificent achievement though it was, first space experiment to measure star positions as it was, the sphere of influence of Hipparchos was just this little yellow uh, blob. We were really only measuring star positions in our celestial backyard. Gaia will uh, expand the sphere of influence to encompass most of the galaxy or, or a large part of, of the galaxy and we will be able to measure these stellar motions and distances all the way through. Now I'm only going to show you one more uh, slide. Again I I, I could tell you at great length in more specialized audiences uh, you can go through and I could tell you what we're hoping to learn from stellar evolution, stellar structure, galactic dynamics, age of the universe, all this kind of thing. But I thought what can I finish with which is, uh, makes a little bit more of an impact. Well, that's an unfortunate word to use here because I'm going to talk about near-Earth asteroids. And the solar system today looks very different to the solar system that, that, that uh, looked like when I was young. When I was young, there were just nine planets and the sun, and that was about it, a few moons here and there. We now know that the solar system is filled with uh, meteorites, small bodies, and uh, amongst these are these things, potentially hazardous objects, near-Earth asteroids that travel close to us. And in this little animation, I took the objects which were known to pass within something like a 50th of the Earth, uh, Earth-Sun distance and just plotted how they move. Now, I'll run this through a couple of times because there's a lot to take in, but we're looking down on the, on the plane of our solar system. This is the Earth, this is the Sun, and these near-Earth asteroids are being attracted by the gravitational field of the Sun. If you watch any one, you'll see them zipping in, uh, curling around the sun, and this slingshot sending it off in some other directions. Now, there's a lot of interest in this. There's been a lot of interest over the last 10 years. Will one of these hit us? Um, has one of these asteroids got our name on it? Uh, when will it hit? And how big will the impact be? And the answer is, of course, many of these things are hitting us and it's only a matter of time before uh, a big one hits us. That could be many millions or hundreds of millions of years. But if you want to look for, say, one practical uh, spin-off of Gaia, uh, uh, the closest we can come to home, it's looking at how near-Earth asteroids are moving through the solar system. And we will be able to predict several uh, decades in advance um, if there is a big rock heading to us we will be able to measure it and classify it with Gaia. So that was it. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Um, now, Brian Cox normally at this point says that... <laughs> now, you see, it's all gone wrong. If it was... Brian Cox would have said, if you want to buy my book, this is it. But it's, it's gone off the screen already. But you can Google it. And I did write a little book, a popular book, about Hipparchos and the making of history's greatest star map. Thank you very much. <laughs>